Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the good news you have given to us to benefit by as well as to proclaim. Whereas that tonight as we go through these verses of the proclamation of the gospel, you'll give us the vision to be able to give this same gospel to people around us in Jesus' name. Amen. Enable us to do your will. And in doing your will, we pray that multitudes will come into the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. That is the title of what the Lord is speaking to us tonight. As we look at the narrative of Philip the Evangelist acting as a soul winner and giving the gospel message to the eunuch of Ethiopia. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. In the preaching of the gospel, we have to go near to the people we are going to present the gospel to. And in one way or the other, we have to join ourselves, identify ourselves with the people. If they're on the move, we're moving along with them. If they're stationary, we're staying where they are. If they're sitting, we're sitting with them. If they're standing, we're standing with them. We're going near to join ourselves unto them so that we'll have the privilege of sharing the gospel with them. Are we surprised? Jesus Christ himself had to come near to this world, be incarnated in the flesh, and then join us, be born in human flesh before he could share the gospel with us. And also the apostles had to come near to the people. They had to go to those synagogues and to those temples, and they had to join the people or identify with the people and share the gospel with them until those disciples were scattered into Judea and they went near and they joined themselves with the people of Judea. Those people in Judea could never hear the gospel and until Philip the evangelist went down into Samaria, went near and then he joined himself, he lived with them, he stayed with them, he related with them, then he couldn't preach the gospel until then. And here was a eunuch of Ethiopia, coming from Jerusalem, and he was seeking and searching after the truth. And then the Spirit said, Philip, there is work to do. And this is one thing you must do. You go near, you join yourself to this chariot and that will afford you an opportunity of giving the gospel to the people who are in need. The successful evangelist, Philip, here gets involved with what we call personal evangelism. He was led of the Spirit of God to bring the gospel to a Gentile, in fact, the first Gentile to be confronted with the saving truth of the gospel. Evangelists or believers are not reservoirs of heavenly treasure or the saving knowledge or the gospel. We are not reservoirs, we are channels. The gospel gets to us and then we pass it across for the benefit of other people. We must be in the world. That means you go near, you join yourself unto them, you sit where they sit, you stand where they stand, you move where they're moving in the world. You identify with them, you come near unto them. And then you're able to bring the message unto them, of course, without becoming corrupted with the system of the world. Now, in the narrative before us, which is um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 25 to 40, you'll see three things that stand out very clearly, among other things, in sharing the gospel. Number one is the proper preparation. Number two the positive presentation, and number three, the personal profession. These are great spiritual principles in soul winning, and we're going to learn about this principle today in the passage we have before us. Let me read to you so you have a feel of the flow of the passage itself. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, from verse 25. 
And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he read Esaias the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet days? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went his way, rejoicing. But Philip was found as Azotus, and passing through, the, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now you know the background to this story. The believers had been scattered away from Jerusalem, but you still had the apostles in Jerusalem and a number of believers in Jerusalem. But then it disturbed, in a way, the organization, the administration, the workforce of the church in Jerusalem. Number one, Stephen, one of those seven men that had been chosen to take care of the special business of distributing food and material things to the needy, had been killed in persecution. And as a result, um, those believers had been scattered. And one of the seven, again, Philip, had been thrown out of Jerusalem. And he came down to Samaria. But they, this is what we find. That those early believers, there was something you find in them. Wherever they were, in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, in the desert or in the city, in the village or in the synagogue, they were doing something. They were preaching the gospel. As individuals, they were sharing the gospel. As uh, communities of believers together, they were sharing the gospel. Be they apostles or disciples, be they real, be they believers or officers in the church, there was something you found them doing. They were sharing the gospel. When they were in Jerusalem, they filled Jerusalem with this doctrine that Jesus is the only Savior. As they came into Judea, they filled Judea with this doctrine. There is no other name, Jesus the Savior. And Philip came to Samaria. Area. There was nothing else to talk about. It was this same Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. So then, every, everywhere they went, they were sharing the gospel. And it ought to be the same today. Everywhere a believer goes, everywhere we're scattered during the week, in the office, in the places where we live, in our various communities, we must be sharing the power of the gospel to save and to deliver. And so they were doing. Now, Philip had shared this gospel with great power 
and with great authority in Samaria. There are many people that came to the Lord, were told in verse 8, there was great joy, the joy of salvation, the joy of deliverance, the joy of receiving the supernatural touch from the Lord in their body, in their soul, in their spirit. They were converted and they were also delivered. There was great joy in that city. Now, we're told as a result of their giving their lives to the Lord, they were baptized in water, in verse 12. And they believed, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Not only that they were saved, not only that they were baptized in water, there was a mighty healing all through. And the people were delivered from evil spirits, in verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did in verse 7, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with pulses, and that were lame, were healed. Now, news go to Jerusalem, that Samaria, as a city, they had received the gospel. Now you know it's wonderful when a single sinner gets saved and it is more wonderful when a whole family gets saved and it is just fantastic when the whole city as a community will just yield themselves completely unto the Lord. Now they heard in Jerusalem that Samaria as a city had received the word of God. You know what they did? They sent Peter and John. What were they to do? They were to uh, have on the spot assessment of what had gone on in Samaria. Was this just an emotional thing? Was it healing that had no deaths? Were there miracles that, had, that were not attended by conversion of souls? They wanted to know. They wanted to have on the spot assessment of what had taken place in Samaria. So they sent Peter and John. Not only that, they wanted to see how Jerusalem, the church, could be of help to Samaria how they could minister unto them the Holy Ghost and confirm the souls of the people that had been given to the Lord. And so the apostles came. When they came, they saw it was something genuine. The salvation was real. The conversions were marvelous. The healings were genuine. And they laid hands on these. I told you, Philip had been preparing the ground. He had not only taught them about Jesus, the Savior, he had also taught them about their sub being submissive to water baptism. They were baptized in water. Not only that, he had told them about the lordship of Jesus, about the kingship of Jesus in the kingdom, and about the believer having a complete submission to that lordship or kingship of the kingdom of the kingdom. And he told them that wasn't possible because there was no way they could have total submission except the Adamic nature was taken away from them. You receive Jesus as Savior, you are born again. You receive Jesus as Lord, as King, and you are submitting to his total authority when you are really sanctified because there is nothing within you to resist that authority of the King. He told them about that kingdom. And he told them, of course, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It is joy in the Holy Ghost. And you can tell the adage. Now they were ready and they, they had even been taught about the Holy Ghost. And the power of the Holy Ghost, the influence of the Holy Ghost, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the influence and all that the Holy Ghost will do, leading them in their lives and guiding them in their ways. All that the apostles needed to do when they came was just to lay hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Of course, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, it doesn't say that directly here, but you know this, that... Um, Simon the sorcerer had seen devils coming out, demons coming out, had seen the lame walking and rising, and had seen miraculous things taking place. He didn't offer money for that, but when those apostles came and they laid hands on these that were saved and sanctified, and something happened that he saw. Because in verse 18 it says, When Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. Now, you don't, to go, you don't need to go into a theological school to know that they spoke in tongues. I'll, I'll show you why we're saying so. Uh, you know, many people who say they receive the Holy Ghost and nothing happens to them. They don't speak in tongues and they just take it by faith. Now, Simon would have seen nothing to make him to offer money if there was not an external demonstration of the Holy Ghost coming upon them. I mean, this man, Simon the sorcerer, 
who had seen uh, evil spirits crying with loud voice and coming out of the people that were possessed. And that didn't, uh, that didn't uh, shake him, that didn't make him to offer money. He had seen people that were lame, lame in, in terrible condition, hands paralyzed, uh, legs paralyzed, and every part of the body not functioning except the head, and even the mouth, the muscles not, uh, not functioning. He had seen them under the prayer of Philip, and these people were rising up. He didn't offer money for that. Now when the apostles came, and they laid hands on these people, and the Bible says the Holy Ghost came on them, it were all quiet. No evidence, no speaking in tongues, nothing that will show anybody that anything was happening, whatever. This man will not offer money for that thing that had no result, but you know, he saw something. In fact, Augustine tells us in his uh, writings, in the, you know, in those early days, Augustine said, well, uh, they spoke in tongues because, you know, it passed on from uh, mouth to mouth. And apart from that, you know, without, even without the um, testimony of Augustine, you know this. Peter will not believe that they got something if they didn't speak in tongues. How did Peter get it? In Acts chapter 2, by speaking in tongues. John would not have believed that, this, that there was anything happening if they didn't speak in tongues. How did John have it by speaking in tongues? Now, listen to me. The church in Jerusalem sent them to Samaria. And that church in Jerusalem will be waiting for them when they came back from Samaria. And they are going to say now, Peter and John, you come and give your report. Your missionary report. Because we sent you down to Samaria so that those people will receive the Holy Ghost. Now, what report will Peter give? If these people in Samaria never spoke in tongues, now will Peter just say, well, we laid hands on them. They didn't even shake. They didn't even make any move. And they, they didn't even speak in tongues. Nothing spectacular happened as a result of our laying hands on them. They'll ask them, why did you come back? Why did you not pray and tarry until the real experience will come upon them? I'm telling you this, they spoke in tongues. And Simon saw that. And, you know, he opened his mouth and he was so surprised he couldn't close his mouth again because he saw those Samaritans as they were speaking in tongues. And he, he was so surprised, he was so amazed that he offered money. He said, I'm looking, I've never seen this. This is fantastic. Give this to me. And if you give this to me, I will just lay my hands on people everywhere and they will be having this same experience so that they'll receive the Holy Ghost. And then they rebuked him. Now, we, we learned all that last week. Now, today, as we come into this passage, look at verse 25. They, referring to Peter and John, when they testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. You know, they, after they laid hands on them and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, then they started teaching them again. Now, listen to me. You know, in many churches, gospel churches, Pentecostal churches, charismatic circles, they don't, they don't submit themselves to the teaching of the word of God. Once they have spoken in tongues, oh, they say we're senior believers. We're super believers. Because we're not only saved, we're not li only living holy lives. You know what? We have this experience that is called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And we speak in tongues, we pray in tongues, and they don't think they need Bible after that. In fact, when the message of the Word of God is going on, somebody will go in the Spirit and shout hallelujah, praise the Lord, start a chorus on the left-hand side, uh, start a, a revelation on the other side, and give, begin to give a prophecy on the other hand, and they say, well, the Holy Ghost says, hey, we don't need Bible. The Holy Ghost says, hey, we don't need teaching. Listen to me. Those apostles laid hands on them. You know what happened? They received the Holy Ghost. Supernatural experience came upon them. And as uh, things began to happen in that fellowship, miracles, and now they even had the gifts of the Holy Ghost. But then they preached the word of the Lord unto them. When you are saved, you have a capacity to receive the word of God. But listen to me, in a measure. Because that cup is small, and that cup you have after you are saved cannot hold too much of the water of life. And you know, when you are sanctified, you have a greater capacity for the teaching, for the revelation, for the deep mystery, the insight into the word of God. Because you know, you have more than a cup now. 
and the Lord is able to give you more of the word of God and you see more of the word but you know when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost then you have a greater capacity for the learning of the word of God the word of God becomes your food becomes your meat and all the time there is a desire within you to want to have a large intake of the word of God that's what happened when they received the Holy Ghost it became it became easier for them to be able to take in the word of God more and more you know there is nothing like you become charismatic and therefore you don't want the word of God anymore you become spiritual you don't want the word of God anymore you just you know some people that say they have the baptism in the Holy Ghost that say they speak in tongues oh they say anytime I just uh, want to have my quiet time I can't read the Bible anymore I just like to pray and to speak in tongues listen to me that's not Bible that's not scriptural because you know what Jesus said he said I have many things to say unto you I cannot tell you now Jesus why because you are saved you just have a little measurable capacity for the Word of God and I can't tell you many things I would have told you and I'm praying for you you get sanctified but yet even after you are sanctified I cannot tell you all the mystery of the kingdom of God because you do not have the total capacity to receive the total entirety the entire Word of God but when that Spirit of God is come when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and you begin to talk in tongues when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and the supernatural begins to happen unto you you know what you have a great capacity for the Word of God and that Holy Ghost will begin to teach you and to teach you and to teach you the Word of God from his anointed ministers through his anointed servants so you see they had got the Holy Ghost and now Peter and John now sat them down settled them down and said now you can really learn and you know people that are zealous before they have the Holy Ghost and they are on fire before they have the Holy Ghost they are consecrated before they have the Holy Ghost because they're seeking they're searching they're running after and they're saying oh Lord give that experience to me I want to have the baptism in the Holy Ghost and they're searching the Bible they read the Old Testament they read the New Testament they read in the major prophets and the minor prophets they read in the book of the kings and the chronicles they read in the Pentateuch they read them um, that means the uh, Genesis Exodus Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy they read in the New Testament they read Revelation before they are baptized in the Holy Ghost they're searching where am I missing it why have I not got this experience what is it that is lacking in my commitment and consecration that I've not got the Holy Ghost and eventually they consecrate so deep and they pray so earnestly and they believe God so much they just lay hold on that promise and the Holy Ghost comes upon them then they rest and, oh now I thank God I don't have to read the Bible anymore like before oh when I was seeking for the baptism in the Holy Ghost I read the Bible I read the Bible but now I can rest you are missing something you are missing something because there is something so deep and so great and so rich and so high that God never told you before you were baptized in the Holy Ghost there is something of the mystery of the of the gospel that Jesus will never share never tell you until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and if after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost you relax you say I don't have to come to Monday Bible study anymore I don't have to come to Thursday miracle revival hour anymore I don't even have to come every time to search the scripture anymore oh you are missing something oh you say now I have the Holy Ghost and I can sit down no the moment you have the Holy Ghost, learning will start. Teaching will start. And you see in verse 25, And they, when they testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem, and they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now in verse 26, we have this Philip. And um, now listen to me. In the preaching of the gospel, there's a great preparation to be done great preparation part of the preparation in fact the greater uh, part of the preparation is done in heaven and uh, the other part of the preparation is done here on earth God is involved in preparing people for the uh, proclamation of the gospel is preparing the preacher is preparing the receiver 
And we're told in verse 26 of the preparation that the Holy Ghost was making, that God was making. Verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, somebody was coming from Jerusalem. He had gone there to worship the Ethiopian eunuch. And he was searching and seeking. And he was saying, oh God, if I can know you more. I've been going to all this synagogue and temple. And yet I feel this emptiness in me, this vacuum in me. I feel that I'm so shallow. I feel that I don't have the real thing. Where is it? And that man had begun to search the scriptures. But then he had not discovered Jesus Christ. He had not known. How shall they know? Except somebody will tell them. And so the, the Lord knew that, and the Lord sent an angel, and the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, and he said, Arise and go, arise and go, arise and go. The leading of the Lord, listen to me, if you are a child of God, the Lord will lead his own children. He will lead in various areas. You know, people were asking questions yesterday. We try to make friendship with these people. We try to preach the gospel to them. And they are not responding. Listen. In a people responding, you have the preparation that is necessary. You have the presentation. And then you have the profession. And they will not come to the last part, the profession, if the other two, the preparation and the presentation, are not all right. Now, you must follow the move of the Spirit. You must follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. And the leading of the Lord as he's leading you to the people that are prepared for the reception of the gospel. Now, the Lord uh, sent this angel. And the angel of the Lord told Philip, he said, arise and go. Now listen to me. Many times, believers have difficulty knowing the leading of the Lord. Now they are waiting behind. And they're saying, well, I know the Lord has spoken to me, but I'm still waiting for more. Listen to me, you'll never get the, what you are waiting for until you act on what God has already told you. You know when we were in school, we studied science, and we studied mathematics, and we studied um, other subjects, literature, many, many things we studied. But now, when it came to mathematics, particularly in geometry, you know, they'll teach us theorem one. And our teachers will do something. And after teaching us theorem 1, they'll give us problems, practical problems, to make use of theorem 1. After we did all those practical assignments, they taught us theorem 2. Then they will not teach us theorem 3 immediately. They'll give us practical assignment again to be able to make use of theorem 2. I'm telling you something. God has given you theory. And until you make a practical in your life what he has already taught you, he will not give you the next step. You know, we did physics and we did chemistry. And sometimes we got into the, into the, in the theory class and he'll teach us the theory in physics or in chemistry. And then we'll go into the laboratory after that and we'll have a practical, a, a practical period. And during that practical period, we're making use of what we had just learned in our theory. And if we didn't do that assignment in practical, you know what? God, um, the people will not give us, the teachers will not give us the very next term. And you know it's the same thing if you're teaching people. If, if people are uh, apprentices in a mechanic washer. That mechanic uh, person that is teaching the fellow will teach him something and then he'll want him to practice on that. If he never practices on what has been taught, that teacher will not teach the next bit of the instruction. You know, it's the same thing in tailoring. Uh, you're teaching a particular person, a man or a woman, you say, well, this is a step to go. But you know, you tell him, but he never practices what you have already told, told him or her. You know, you will not tell, teach the next step if you're a real wise teacher. The same thing with God. When God calls you and he tells you something and he says, now you take a step, you say, well, I'm waiting for the next instruction. The Lord will not tell you the next instruction. Look at verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, arise and go toward the south. You know, he didn't tell him the city where he was going, the place where he was going, just toward the south, unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, just unto the way, which is the desert. Are there people there for me to talk to? 
When I get there, what are you going to give me? Are you going to give me a revelation? Are you going to give me an assignment? Just arise and go. Now he arose and he went. And then the Lord could bring the next step. And you know in your life, many times people want to become workers in the church, full-time workers. And maybe the Lord has been talking to them and then, uh, you know, they come to the pastor and they say, well, what am I going to do? They want the pastor to table it out. The program of the church for the next 20 years, if Jesus tarries. They want the pastor to say, well, if you start now and you begin at this point, next year you'll be uh, doing this and the other year you'll be doing this and the other year you'll be doing that. God never acts like that. God never acts like that. I won't show you the whole picture till you get started. You know, sometimes uh, people want to be involved in the work of the church, not even as full time. But now a bit of it has been revealed. And they are wondering, well, uh, that's not a perfect situation for me to get into because uh, the work of a zona leader is so limited. Is that all I will be doing? Well, you get started on that first. Well, if I'm going to be in the choir, will I eventually be playing a, an instrument of my choice? You get started. Even if it's a rudiment you are being exposed to, get started. That's the way of God. Well, if I'm going to be a usher, am I going to be at the car park or in the auditorium or what am I going to do? You just get started. Submit yourself. You know the way the Lord is leading. Now on marriage, people are having a lot of trouble knowing the will of God, especially women, ladies, their sisters, they are born again. But you know what? Oh yes, God, I'm your child. And since I'm your child, tell me the whole story. This person has spoken to me. I want to know your will. Now, if, if this is your will, you tell me what is going to happen when I get to the home of this person. After one year, after two years, after 20 years, are we going to just live for 40 years, 50 years before we die? And there is silence because God is not a talker to you. You know, God doesn't talk like you talk. And when God says, arise and go, you better go. When God says, this is what to do, it's not time to be asking many questions, many questions. Oh Lord, I just want to be very, very sure. And then there is silence because God will not talk anymore. Who do you think God is? Now, Philip heard that. And he arose and he went. That's in verse 27. He arose and he went. I told you about preparation. Proper preparation. God himself was really prepared. And he sent an angel. And now the preacher was prepared. He was submissive. And then he went. And now the Ethiopian eunuch himself. You know what? That Ethiopian eunuch was even himself getting ready. In verse 27. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of uh, the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure. And had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near, join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran. You see that? Oh, that man was yielded to the spirit of God. Philip ran. Philip ran. He ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And said, Understandest thou what thou readest? You see, in this preparation, number one, there was a supernatural work. Two, there was a submissive will. And three, there was searching worship. Supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had been working both on the heart of Philip and also in the mind of the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Holy Spirit was making him to search. It was making him to just want to find out more and more about the Lord. The Lord had made a preparation in a supernatural way. Number two, the submissive will of Philip, wanting to do anything, anywhere, anytime, as the Lord will lead. And you know it will be like that. You'll be hearing the Lord talking to you in the office because the Lord is preparing every time. The, there are times the Lord is preparing the hearts of the sinner. And you know it is always like that. You remember Elijah and Elisha? Elisha was in the field just tilling the ground with the plow. But then God had prepared Elijah in a supernatural way. And there was that supernatural work leading Elijah to Elisha. But nobody knew that Elisha also had received an indication from the Lord himself, one way or the other. And then Elijah went and just threw the mantle on him. 
And Elisha immediately responded and said, Oh yes, I'll be coming. Oh yes, I'll be coming. Let me just say bye-bye at home and I'll be coming. The Lord had prepared both of them. You remember, Matthew was sitting at the receipt of custom. And Jesus came to him. But there was preparation. Of course, Jesus was prepared of the Holy Ghost because he was full of the Holy Ghost and led of the Spirit all the time. And that man was on the, on the side of the road. Matthew, the Levite. And um, you know, as, he came, as Jesus came there, he said, follow me. There wasn't much preaching. There wasn't much argument. There wasn't a question and answer period. But that man just arose and he followed him and even gathered publicans and sinners together and he made Jesus to be able to talk to them. There was real preparation. Supernatural work and, so, and a submissive will. And then you know the case of uh, Andrew coming to Peter and saying, Peter, we have found him. Who is that? The Messiah? Of whom we have been reading about in the scriptures, I saw him. And I know this is the Christ. Let's go. And you know there was no argument from Peter. And he came to Jesus Christ. Andrew brought him to Jesus Christ. And the moment Jesus saw him, he said, you are Peter and you will be called a stone. And then he followed. You know there was supernatural work already done. And there was that submissive will. And you know there was searching worship. This Ethiopian you know, had been searching the scriptures. Searching the scriptures, searching the scriptures. And you know, these things go together. And as we're going to witness, ask yourself, are you supernaturally prepared? Has the supernatural work been done to prepare you? And are you living and are you listening to the Holy Ghost preparing the people you are talking to? Then is there a submissive will when the Lord says, Arise and go, you arise and you go? And when the Lord says, speak out, you speak out. When the Lord says, well, eh, contact that person, talk to that individual, you do it. And then the searching worship. That's the first thing. The scriptural word of Isaiah. Eh, you know that man had been keeping that scripture. And he had been just going over that scripture. Obviously he had got eh, that scroll from Jerusalem. He had bought it at a great price. And he had been reading from that scroll of Isaiah. And he came to that chapter 53 of Isaiah. And um, he read it. And uh, there was something that was saying, wait here a moment and read it again. He read it again. He knew there was something beneath the surface. He knew there was water beneath the surface of the ground. He knew that the word of salvation was hidden inside that passage, inside that chapter. But he couldn't see it. He couldn't understand it. But something on the inside was saying, you stay there and read it more. He read it again. But he didn't understand. But the Spirit said there is something more to be read there, to be understood there, that will get you out of the emptiness and the shallowness and the vacuum of your spiritual life and just get into the abundance of the spiritual life. Read it again and he read it again until this Philip came. Now we go from that proper preparation to the positive pre presentation. In um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 30, and... Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? How can I? How can I? Except some man should guide me. We don't read the Bible like we read literature book. And you can say, well, I studied English at the university, therefore I have the ability to understand the Bible myself. You don't. The natural man perceiveth not the things of God. They're mystery to him, they're foolishness to him. It's not grammar, it's not English, it's not intelligence, it's not wisdom, it's by the Spirit of God. How can I accept some man should guide me? You know the status of this man? He was the treasurer of the whole province, country of Ethiopia. And he was working directly under the queen of Ethiopia. You know that time, we have Ethiopia today, but that time Ethiopia was something larger. Because it was just like an empire that, uh, that uh, ruled over much of Africa. It was almost the whole of Africa below the Sahara. And uh, you know, this man that was a treasurer under that queen, it was a great thing. 
and yet with all the status, with all the position, with all the understanding, with all the intelligence, with all the position that he had, he couldn't understand that thing on his own. And so he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip to come up and sit with him. And how came the, pre the presentation? The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumped before his sharer, so he opened not his mouth. Talking about Jesus Christ the Messiah. Talking about the betrayal of Jesus, the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? Talking about his sacrificial death, the way he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, I beg you, I plead with you, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture underline that in your Bible at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus now please look up here when I talk of positive presentation I'm not talking of not talking not talking against sin I'm not talking about you know just being sentimental and emotional and just you know telling the people uh, they're going to heaven if they will just uh, come along with you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about at the point where you meet the people, you start talking to them about the Lord. You know there is something. Now listen to me. We don't uh, cut down and criticize and destroy what other people are doing. But, you know, as I'm teaching you, there are people that uh, concentrate on a particular mode of presentation of the gospel. They call it the four spiritual laws. Now, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Now, uh, they tell you that Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then you go from there to Romans 6. You go from there, you go to um, John chapter 3 verse 16. You go from there, you go to John chapter 1 verse 12. You go from there, you go to another passage. And anybody they want to talk to, anytime, anywhere, at any situation, it is the same system they go through. But you know, it doesn't work always like that. He began at the same scripture. If you are going to really present the gospel. Now, this is what has been hindering your own evangelism from being effective. You are not able to start at the point where people are. With scripture or with the spirit of God. But have you ever noticed in the Bible? How Jesus will start at the point where the people are. And from there, he will take them on. Listen to me. He met a woman at the well of water, the Samaritan woman. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus started right there and he started talking about salvation, the water of life. Some people were seeking for Jesus Christ because they are taking bread, I mean the ordinary bread, and they were looking for him to make him king. And Jesus wanted to present the gospel to them. How? By telling them about the bread of life. Some people came to give Jesus Christ a news, the news item of the day that came up and said, well, the tower fell upon some people and they died. And Jesus started right from that point of the news item and said, do you think those people are more sinners than you are except you repent? Something is going to happen. A man had just received healing and Jesus found that man in the temple and said, now you don't commit sin anymore because you don't want a greater sin, a worse sin to come upon you. Jesus always started at the point he met people. And you know, Paul the apostle did the same. He saw them, they were worshipping idol in that city. And when they were worshipping idol, they even had a writing to the unknown God. And Paul started right at that point. And he started giving them the gospel. You know, Peter did the same thing. They all came together in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And they were amazed and astonished. And they were saying, what is the meaning of this? Because they had those people in the upper room speaking with tongues. And you know, Peter started right at that point, And he said, this is that. Which Joel spoke about. And he gave them a reason for the speaking in tongues. And then he slides into the preaching of the gospel. And 3,000 got converted. That's a positive presentation. You start where the people are. If they're sick... 
and they're looking for healing, start from that point of healing. If they are poor and looking for provision, start from that point of provision. If they are discussing something in the office and it's, a, it's bothering them, start from that point. If you're in the village and they are talking about something that is bringing a problem to them, start from that point. Philip began at the same scripture. You know some evangelists, they have some messages that they always preach. They are not resourceful. They do not study the word of God. And whatever the situation is, they do not know how to match everything together so that they will present the gospel. The same thing on Thursday when um, preachers preach on salvation. Now you know if we're going to have positive preparation, you ought to know what the people are looking for. When the people come here, they come here because of need. They come because they want to get healed. They come because they want to have the provision of the Lord. They come because they want to be delivered from the devil. You talk about that and then link it to salvation. You know, but if you just come to the people and say you are looking for healing, but that's not important, you just close their minds to the salvation message you are presenting. You are having trouble in your family, but you know that's not important. What is important is getting to heaven. You close their mind to uh, what you are really presenting unto them. You begin at the same point where you meet them. And then you are able to present the gospel to them to get them saved. That's what they did in the New Testament church. That's what you ought to do now. Now, in Philip's approach, we see three things. His approach was constructed on scripture. It started at the same scripture. It was centered on the Savior. He preached unto him Jesus. That's what he always do. And it concerned salvation. He talked to him so much that he believed and he became saved. True evangelism will present the way of salvation to the searching heart. How do you do it? In a courteous manner. Great respect. You don't point to the person and say you are a sinner, you are going to die and go to hell. If you don't repent, you destroy the work the Holy Ghost has been doing. Listen to me. Before you ever come to preach to anyone, the Holy Ghost has been laboring on that individual. Before you ever come to present the gospel to an individual, the Holy Ghost has been working on that individual to get that individual saved has been drawing him, moving him, leading him, and uh, bringing something to his remembrance and telling him, you ought to dress, draw nearer God, dress nearer God. You ought to seek the face of the Lord. The Holy Ghost has been doing a great work before you ever come to present the gospel. Now, if you come in and you do something foolish, something irritating, something that is so um, unconscious, uh, that is not a good uh, you, you know, you, you just scare the person away and then you destroy what the Holy Ghost has been doing in preparation of uh, that individual for the gospel. So have a positive preparation, presentation. And make sure you are watching them. See at the point where they are. And just at the point of their need, move in and then give the gospel message. You know, if the preparation is alright and the presentation is suitable, the consequence will follow. There will be a personal profession of faith. The people will yield. The people will give themselves. Now, please, in this area, I'm very concerned. Look up here. Many people make a serious mistake. Now, you are saved. You are born again. How did you get born again? Maybe in your own case, you heard a message. You went on your knees. When you went on your knees, you cried, you wept, you agonized for days before you could know how to get really, how to get through and really get saved. You know the mistake you make? You want everybody to cry like that before they get saved? You want everybody to agonize like that before they get saved? Well, listen to me. Go through your whole Bible, New Testament. You'll find some people that wept, that woman, that came to Jesus Christ in the house, and was weeping, really weeping. She felt sorry, so sorry for her sin. So sorry she had been a terrible sinner. And she wept and she cried. And the tears were coming on the feet of Jesus Christ. And she wiped everything away with her ear. And Jesus said, woman, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are taken away. Go in peace. And she was saved. But look up here. How about Matthew the publican? Did he agonize like that? Pray like that? No. Jesus just met him and said, follow me. Was he saved? 
If he wasn't saved, he will never become an apostle. But he was saved, he became a brother, became a disciple, became a worker, became an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was saved without agony, without tears, without weeping. Everybody will not get saved the same way. You remember Zacchaeus on the, on the treetop? And she, he was washing that crowd. And as the crowd was coming with Jesus Christ, he came down. Because Jesus told him, Zacchaeus, come down. I must abide in your house today. And that man began to confess his own sin, saying, Oh Lord, if I've done any evil thing and I've defrauded people, I will restore to them fourfold. Not only that half of my good I will give to the poor. Jesus said, I see the faith in your heart today. Salvation entered into this house without any weeping and without any long, arduous type of prayer that is agonizing. You know, he just gave his life to the Lord in that simple way. And of course, he was saved. Jesus said he was saved. Today, salvation entered into this house. And you know, this man, the eunuch of Ethiopia, when did he have time to pray for long hours, long hours, long hours before he got saved? No time. You know, Philip was just sharing with him in a chariot, and they were moving on and moving on and moving on and he took all that word in his faith just held on to that word and by faith he had got it already and now when they came to where, where they saw water wasn't that a miracle to see water in the desert I'm telling you that when God is in the business everything is well prepared everything is well prepared it was a desert place and yet there was a water there and in verse 36, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Ah, uh ah, -uh, you can't be baptized like that. You have not cried. You have not wept. <laughs> you know, we lost uh, a full time worker. I think it was last year. Because of this point. Because, you know, we'll come for Sunday worship. And when we came for Sunday worship, he had been, he had been going to a church before. That, uh, you know, before they get saved, people could pray for three years. Before they really get saved, they could pray for a long time. And they could cry and weep and, you know, stay at the altar and stay for hours. Pray for three hours, four hours without end. A sinner. And he could pray for those three hours and not get saved. And come back next Sunday again. Come back next Sunday again. And do that for six months or for one year or for three years before getting saved. That man was going to that church before. And now he, you know, he became, he was going coming to this church eventually even became a full-time worker but you know what we'll finish um, Sunday worship and he will run to that other church in town because he wanted the opportunity to cry to weep and to pray that long prayer and sometimes they will even say well I will not come to Sunday worship full-time worker full-time worker and they will miss the Sunday worship here and go to the other place and pray long prayer Eventually, I saw him. I said, my brother, now we need to talk about it. What's the matter? What's happening to you? I see that you are not at the Sunday worship yesterday. What happened? Then he smiled and said, well, you know, the word of God is good here. But you know, this word of God, can it do anybody any good at any time? When there is, because we don't have long time to pray and really agonize. I said, you mean nobody is saved in this place because they don't have all that long, adios, an hour of agonizing in prayer? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, you know. I said, look at me, am I saved? Look at these other workers in the church, are they saved? Have you seen their lives? Have you seen the power of God moving? You come to Thursday and see how the people pray on Thursday. We just pray, meet it and the people are healed. And miracles are happening. It is by faith, it is not by the long uh, crying and the emotion. Eventually, you know, he couldn't understand and he had to go to that church, leave full-time work in a ministry like this and just go as an ordinary member to that church to have an opportunity to pray the way he wanted. But listen to me. I'm not opposing that church. I, I love everybody on the face of the earth. 
but you know, I need to teach you the word of God. This Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't have all that long time, all that long time of weeping and crying and beating the bench and rolling on the ground before he could get saved. He just said, well, I have believed already with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and I believe I'm ready for water baptism. What happened? Verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And, he, and they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Now listen to me. When God is sending you to do something, don't bother about the cost. You know, between Samaria and this place, it was about 125 miles. And maybe when the Lord was telling uh, this man, arise and go to that place, he might be thinking, well, oh Lord, if I obey you, what transport will I take back? You don't worry about that. You go and obey the Lord. He obeyed the Lord and immediately he finished that and the Lord knew that the work had been done. Salvation had come into the soul, into the mind, into the spirit, into the heart of that individual. The spirit of God caught him away, transported him away, and he was in the place he ought to be. That's another miracle. And he went on his way rejoicing. Now, was that man saved? Now listen to me. When we read the Bible, we should read with faith, read with understanding. Was he saved? The Spirit told the Philip, join yourself to this chariot to do what? To preach the gospel to him until he's saved. He preached. The man said, I believed. He was baptized in water. And instead of the Spirit of God allowing Philip to stay around, the, the Spirit of the Lord said, Philip, the work is done. The name is in the book of life. And now there is a joy of salvation in his soul. Now I want to help you. You don't have to walk back. You don't have to take a chariot. You don't have to look for anything. The work is so wonderfully done and God is so happy. We're giving you a special transportation. And he transported him. That miracle was done. And that man that was saved went on his way rejoicing. And Philip was found where? At Asotos. What was he doing? Passing through, he preached. Passing through, he preached. In all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. Now as the Lord has spoken to us tonight, I believe that what the Lord is doing, he will continue in Jesus' name. And as the Lord is sending us, let us respond to the love of God. Telling other people, instructing other people, but let us be mindful of what the Lord wants to do. Let us be mindful of the way he wants us to go. And as we do it, the Lord will bless the work of our hand in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're here tonight, I've already told you, you can get saved right here. Because before you came here, the Lord had been working on you. The Lord had been preparing you. And the Lord has prepared us also preaching unto you. Everything is just in line. And you have had the presentation. Jesus died for you. And if you just give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God. Even as many as believed on his name, he will save you. And the joy of salvation will come up from your heart. Rise up and let us us pray. You thank the Lord for what is revealing to us in the word of God. Thank the Lord. The richness of the word of God, the depths of the word of God, just thank him. And if you are not saved, just give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Turn away from sin understand that salvation is an accomplished work on the cross of calvary and the moment you receive that moment you are saved open your heart to the lord and as the lord is telling you as members of the body of christ to preach the gospel to tell others of the saving gospel of the Lord then tell them tell them that they may be saved 